Okay, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, forum, the Informational League of Voters Informational Forum on School Funding in Ohio. Um, the League of Women Voters is over years old, and the women's chapter is going to be celebrating our 75th anniversary this coming this year coming up. And that's 75 years of, I think, continuously or almost continuously flying the voters of Bay Village with informational forums of this nature. And um, to help to help voters make educated decisions when they go into the polls. This one is particularly timely because we have a decision on how to vote for a school levy that's on our ballot in November. We have an outstanding panel of speakers who between them have over 100 years of experience in the field of funding for public education. So I'm looking forward to what they have to say. Probably 120 years. Um, I was at the library last month doing a, a, a voter education, or a, a voter, it was for voter information day. And this woman came up to me who said, when we started talking about the school, and she said that her father was immigrant from Latvia, and he, once he became a citizen, voted in every election, and he always voted for the school levels. Um, and even on his deathbed, that was the last thing he did was vote for a school level, because he said, as your education, as goes your education system, so goes your democracy. So this is what we're, yeah, this is what we're talking about tonight is our education system and how it is doing to promote a healthy democracy. We have four speakers. Our first speaker is Lisa Kayser, who is the education office for the Nickel Mountain Voters of Ohio, with over 40 years' experience working with the legislature and community on education issues. And how many levels? 20. 20 levels. Okay. Uh, next up will be Jim Bess. Jim is an attorney, former state legislator, and longtime advocate for fair school funding, serving as direct executive director for the Alliance for Adequate School Funding. And that might be called something different now. That's, that's it. Okay, great. Um, then uh, we have Senator Matt Dolan. He's our own state senator here in District 24. He's head of the Senate Finance Committee, which will be determining the fate of the fair school funding plan passed by the legislature next year. And he will talk with us about current and pending legislation school funding. And he gets extra credit for being here because he's missing part of the uh, garbage day. <laughs> I think we've got a year in time for him to get the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rumi and Aha will be based with Superintendent Scott Pebbles, who will talk with us specifically about what this means for Bay Village. Uh, Mr. Pebbles has been superintendent for over 35 years and comes with long experience in dealing with school levies. Um, at the end of the talk, so every person is going to give their talk on their own particular subjects. And uh, at the end, we will have a QA conversation amongst the speakers. And I think, uh, given the size of the crowd, we'll just go ahead and uh, take um, uh, oral questions as we go along. So, um, Susan, you can start it off. Okay, so sorry. Okay. So, I'm going to read because I'm very. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be a member of the League of Women Voters of Ohio, and I'll just say to my class, is one of its basic principles that all children deserve a free and high quality of life. This basic principle and a number of uh, decisions about funding a constitutional system. Guide the leaps of advocacy around school funding to such a tonight's forum. So, thank you all for being here. While school funding feels like a rather dry and technical subject that is best left to experts, and as a subject that chose to ignore for many, many years, it is the key to something that we all want for kids access to high quality education that prepares them for thoughtful citizenship and an equal chance to success in life. It's this goal that has put me to pay much more attention to how schools are funded in Ohio. It is actually pretty interesting. It's based on very inspiring principles, 
It attempts to meet the diverse needs of students and the diverse needs of our 600 school districts. It's really something we understand. I hope to convince you that this still learning matters, that getting it right is challenging, and that making our system constitutional is within reach and needs our support. For a disclaimer here, this is the lay citizen's perspective. The experts on this topic are sitting next to me. So if I get it wrong, you can please it correctly. So, in our democracy, everyone is equal, and so is every voter. Foundation of our democracy, the founders of our democracy, understood the importance of educating voters for self rule. They understood that it were left to the individual to pay for education. And some people would have it, and some would not. And the quality of their experience would be extremely different. If all voters are equal, then all must have the same opportunity to be prepared to vote. This is the basic justification for our system of public schools. Schools that are free and open to all. The system was created to serve the common good. All individuals benefit from being educated. They are not the primary beneficiaries. It is the public, it is our communities, and it is our democracy. That's why all of us, even people who don't actually use our schools, help to pay for them because we are all the beneficiaries of the businesses. The civic purpose is the reason that every state constitution, including Ohio's, makes funding and operating the system of public education a responsibility of state government. In fact, it's the only state function, I believe, where the legislature is mandated to provide funding. In the last 30 years, there's been increasing pressure for those who are not particularly committed to a public season to use public funds to privatize education, to change the focus from the common good to individual choice. Funding this departure from the public purpose and making education a consumer choice is not provided for by the institution. Our system has always allowed the people to opt out of our public system, but at their own expense. That changed in 1997 when state approved the charter schools as a pilot program in Lewis County. And the first voucher program was the Kidistani program in Easter the same year. These small steps started in Avalanche. So, where do schools get their money? Well, the federal government makes a small contribution to public education. It's about 6% of the funds in most local school districts. This is primarily a state responsibility that is based on a state and local partnership in raising the resources fund each school. The local share is typically funded by property taxes that voters must agree to. And the state share comes out of state revenue. The source of the funding amount must be approved by at least 50 members of the state house, 17 members of the Senate, and more. A significant goal for the state funding structure is to ensure that, regardless of the capacity of a local school district to fund a high quality education, all communities will have sufficient resources to make that possible. It's a fantastic goal. It really means that the state role is to make sure we all have access to compensate the differences in local community capacity. So making the system work well is a work in progress. Education is the largest part of the state budget, and as the state has grown and the state government has taken on more obligations, the legislature has adopted a variety of revenue sources that help fund those and responsibilities as well as education. And the percentage of funding coming from the state has fluctuated. This percentage is so critical, to, the percentage is so critical to the, the greater the, the percentage funded by the state, the less the increases in local capacity of the and they have less of that. So the initial system going back to 1851 um, was funded about four, only 4% came from the state, but it was a 2 million levy of all school districts was um, levied from the levies of schools. In the Depression, districts were tougher, and the state approved an income tax. 
the state contribution increased to about 50%. In the mid 1940s, this dropped to about 36%. Um, in, eight, in 1983, I think we, uh, we, uh, we started the lottery in 1981, but in 1983, um, the funding for the lottery were earmarked to go to education, and the percentage of funding to pay for the state um, increased to between 46 and 47 percent, which was most of the time. In 1991, a coalition of 500 school districts in the state challenged the constitution, constitutionality of the funding system. They, there was a lot of attention, particularly to the differences in facilities. I can remember the, the videos and documentary showing how that system spent in schools um, and serious problems with the facilities. In 1997, that was called the law case. In 1997, the Supreme Court agreed with the plaintiffs. State funding was neither adequate nor equitable. It was not based on what uh, educating children actually thought, and were allowed way too heavily in the funding process. Those local sources that by the very nature promote unequal opportunity. After that decision, there were a few attempts to improve funding, and some did stay, others did not. A permanent solution has been elusive. In 2015, um, representatives Cup and Patterson, the bipartisan team, got together to figure out a lasting remedy that was constitutional called the Fair School Funding Plan. Representatives, the Cup Patterson Plan. The key features it's based on the actual cost of, fun, fun, of educating children. It increases the state investment for all districts, and it's more precise in computing what um, what would be clear to the local to contribute to that base cost. It also ended the reduction funding method, which is how we're funding charter schools and graduates, which made local school districts contribute part of the cost um, for those private choices. As we know, property values in Ohio's 609 school districts vary widely across the state, and the income levels of the residents of our communities um, the income levels of the residents of our communities also vary. So the local capacity to fund schools also vary. One of the best ways to make the system fair and to reduce the impact of this inequality of local capacity is to rely more on state funds to pay more of the cost. Um, so this graphic shows the state local split since the overall decision. And the blue part is the local percentage, and the lower one is the state. And you can see at this point the local contributions are fifty five point two percent. So the state share is less than twenty five percent. So an ongoing problem with the state funding system being constitutional. Is the state is not carrying a large enough burden. At one time during this period, um, that was in 2010, did the local contribution exceed 50%. And as, despite adopting the Fair School Funding Plan formula to meet the budget, it is not fully funded, so we still have not solved the problem. In 2021, the state contribution was at 44%, and I believe that we don't know exactly where it would be um, until next spring. So the Durrell decision established important principles for the constitutional system. Using actual cost of education to determine acceptable funding levels is important. Less reliance on property taxes and greater contribution to the private state, and distributing the state share in a way that accurately accounts for variations in local costs.
So we are making progress. The line item in the state budget that covers support for K-12 education in the state is called funding for funding. Well, some education funding appears in other parts of the budget. This is the per pupil funding that is for basic operating support. Well, in the past, this would have been exclusively for traditional public schools and the education district. We now use funding vouchers, STEM schools, and charter schools. They're all considered part of the foundation. More than 1.5 million has been earmarked um, for each year in the biennium for private schools. This is about the funding amount that is needed to fully fund the fair school funding plan. So while states are spending on education has increased, a lot of that being is going to the option. So the last budget adopted the new formula for foundation funding for traditional public schools that achieved many of the criteria for an institutional funding system. It's a big puzzle trying to account for unique needs of 609 school districts and the diverse needs of our students. And it recognizes and it recognizes the impact of the taxes on communities. The base cost is the part of the school funding system that establishes the floor for spending. It's the amount of every district is guaranteed for each student. Each state, um, both the state and each community, contributes to that cost. But how much of each contributes depends on the local capacity of that community. That cost was aligned by using six different cost moments, which the experts that I've been with them elucidated the which was extremely important. It also covered a more precise the capacity of local districts to pay for the cost. It increased the, uh, the base cost in 2019 for the was $6,010. So when this is fully funded, it's expected to be about $7,100, but that will change for this district as we go ahead the base cost. At, the, at this point in the budget, they adopted the $6,100 to be the base cost that was paid with the land. So we have a lot more to go to that to be It also establishes increased funding levels for categorical aid. These are the special costs for the unique needs of certain groups of children, such children with disabilities, English language learners, particularly in the Philippine and poverty. These categorical aids of um, extra uh, contribution are that funding comes from the state. This is extremely important to the students as well. It also added money for transportation. And school districts are very different than their geography and the number of private schools they have to um, transport along with the school districts. So that's another kind of diversity that needed to be attended. That you can get because foundation funding is, the, is in the budget, which is only a two year law, none of the fair school funding plan is guaranteed beyond this school year. We would really be glad to be looking for more. The workers are going to take office in January. They'll decide what happens next. They can decide if they want to make it a free standing bill or continue to deal with it in the year life. And they will have to decide which parts of it, what spending spending level, will actually be in the next budget if they choose to follow that. So, this is so it's, a, it's uncertain what will happen next. So, we have to pay attention going forward. The plan has to be fully funded and it has to be secure if we are really going to have a special position. So, the uh, next few speakers can tell us a lot more about that and what we can expect in the future. Now, before I quit, oh. I want to answer the question Will levies become less free? Is there any need for local tax credits? 
I did a public school advocate in order for the to make the that was so that's I learned that while I tend to think of public education in terms of my community, it is actually that our, our community schools are part of our state system of public education. So it's very important for thinking about a local community, what's happening in state policy related to school funding. I think the state and local partnership in funding our schools is a good idea. However, every level brings with it serious challenges. We ask people on limited incomes to spend more. And every time the tax code goes up, the ability to maintain control of the residence goes down. It strains our community members' support levels. We have to do better. This isn't just about education, it it's really about sustainable. Every time the legislature decides to cut taxes, spend more on private education, or fails to increase its investment in public education, it puts more pressure on our law to pass my taxes to fund the difference. That suggests to me that the first step for local tax relief is for school funding. As long as we fund schools through a state through a state or local partnership, we need to increase that state contribution. But I don't think that local the local contribution will always be needed. Second, while public education is in the constitution, private education is not. But since 1997, we made that in many ways a priority for spending the state funding. This doesn't, this not only reflects the retreat from the campus, but it makes it hard to find our public education system that's needed to be able to do things with it. If we want this to only put the schools prepared, we have the appetite and means of public transportation options. Another issue that affects local spending is that education costs are not in the region of the They go up, but there is really no revenue source that they go up. House Bill 9 has been passed in the 1970s and now embedded in the Constitution, um, prevents local tax revenue to increase if the value of property goes up. The, the amount of revenue that you can get from a, from a levy is fixed at the amount that you gather that it was being received. So you can't, it doesn't go up even if your property values were to go up. That means levies are going to be with us. And finally, even if the base cost is much in need, it rarely satisfies local expectations for education. Districts can spend more than what the state requires, and they will spend more to provide education opportunities that make their community's expectations quality. And there will always be that force that we're at this I believe public education is a set of our democracy. We need to redouble our commitment to its public purpose, and we need to reshape our funding system to allow them. So let's see what we can do. Yes, dear. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> okay, Mr. Betts, you're up. Good evening. Uh, I don't know what I can say to uh, Senator Bowen right now. Uh, I know where his mind is. <laughs> but at the same time, the fact is he is indicative of the commitment we made to serve the people of the country. And I think we all are. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me try to uh, just make a brief uh, summary. Of well, how the Bearsley Fund uh, differs from so many of those other plans that went before us. You've already heard a wonderful history of school funding in the state of Ohio. All of the basic highlights have been touched upon, and I hope that you understand that, that there has been a constant evolution. It's such that uh, in 2017, not 2015, 2017, even if it's long enough, we don't have to add anything. <laughs> That John Patterson talks about uh, uh, an interesting combination of individuals. Uh, John Patterson, 29 year teacher of American history, uh, took early retirement when the school district for which he was working in Jefferson, Ohio, and was confronted with the reduced revenues available from school funding in 2010. And he said, I've always wanted 
to learn from Charlie Bravo so I could help fix the thing. So he took early retirement to go one of the five to remain on the payroll at the high school. But it was because that he wanted to fix the economy. Bob Cox, by the way, was first effort ever to run the public office. Bob Cox had already been in public life for almost 30 years when he was elected to the House in 2014. I mean, the fact he was elected to the House in 2014. Bob Cox had been a He had been a state senator for 15 years during the time he was at the government of the he was appointed to the club court after he was appointed and the court was there for so he was coming and the government was at the court. So when we talk about the law of the city, on the advantage of the third, we were going to try to add during the court regulation and development on the law to sit in with us and constantly look at what we should make sure that did in fact meet the need of the court decision. Court decision, I should say. Bob Cobb has been a lifelong resident of the county of Carolina. John Patterson, a lifelong resident of that city of Carolina, and where he worked as teacher and such. And these are people who have had a civility throughout their lives and some of them. First thing that they want is to make sure that everybody understood was that the current funding formula at that time was important. They could point out patients, chapters, one after another. But one of the most remarkable is the three separate school districts in the state. The three of them had property valuation and per people income of approximately the same. They were different sizes, they were different. Yeah, geographically, but essentially their funding capabilities were approximately the same. One of those schools that just received $8,100 per pupil from the state in 2018. Another received about $8,400 per pupil. The third received $12,940. Interestingly, since we're talking about the partnership between state funding and local funding, the effective millage of those three districts also varied substantially. This is how they vary. With $8,100 each year, and in effective millage, the related millage, especially between 37 and 22, the school district that received $8,400 per pupil in 2018 had effective millage of 52.2 were concerned about, and they went to the wall to fund their schools. The third district that was receiving 12,940 had effective millage of 22. Now, that doesn't sound fair. It doesn't sound like it's fair to the students. It doesn't sound like it's fair to the district. It doesn't sound like it's fair to the tax. And the objectives of the fair school funding plan have become to be fair to all three. And I think they have done a wonderful job of trying to achieve that goal, but we all know that nothing is perfect and anything as complicated and comprehensive as the Fair School Funding Plan is not perfect. And as Senator Dole will tell you, it needs to look pretty, if, if nothing else. But here was the simple direction that the group representatives gave to the 16 member work group, of which Scott Prebles has been one throughout its inception and after its first meeting in November of 2017. They decided that they wanted a school funding system that was developed, crafted, expanded upon, developed a meaning by people who on a day-to-day -day basis had the responsibility for the structure, the instruction of their kids and grandchildren and running those school districts that of course were responsible for that instruction. They wanted superintendents and treasurers to be a part of crafting this system. 
And so they develop eight subgroups by subject. And each of those group, subgroups was co chaired by an active superintendent, all of which was Scott Rebels, and by an active treasurer. So that as they held their hearings, they invited in various people, experts, citizens, teachers, principals, and people who basically were just concerned about education. They made sure that they had people there who understood what was happening in the district, what was happening in the classroom, what was happening, trying to find the finances and hence the finances of running the school district. So from the very beginning, they were also told one other thing. Whatever you come to recommend with regard to the subject matter to which you have been assigned, you're going to have to justify that by accepted research, by established best practices, by programs that we knew succeeded in other states, by their own professional judgment and experience. They had to justify, justify, justify every single recommendation that was to go into this piece of legislation. And that, by the way, is a, a mantra that Patterson have held them to throughout the formulation. They also were told that every dollar that we spend is going to have to stand for something. One of the problems with the base cost that we talked about before, the $6,020 in 2018, 19, 20, was the fact that nobody knew how that had been crafted, what it stood for. There was meaning when it was originally crafted uh, about six or seven years earlier, but that had lost its meaning simply because of the fact that there had been inflation costs had increased and various aspects of that should have been changed, but weren't because practices were changing. And they insisted upon full, absolute uh, visibility, the identification of each one of those factors. The base cost that has been uh, described here earlier tonight was broken down into individual units, health, services, etc. With the cost established based upon the data accumulated in Ohio. For example, the classroom instruction, the instruction had ratio, pupil teacher ratios for the various classes K through 12. For kindergarten, it was 20 to 1. For grade 1, 2, and 3, 23 to 1. For 4 through 8, 25 to 1. And for the high school years, uh, 27 to 1. That means that there is no single base cost anymore because it depends a little bit upon how the students in your particular school district are divided among those various class ranges as to whether or not you're going to get more or less monies than school district decide here. But then they also said these teachers need to have some days off for professional development. From time to time, they're going to need a substitute teacher. And as a result, that base cost classroom instruction applied, and I should say applied Ohio data to make sure it funded all of those elements that went into that particular component. The same kind of detail was made available in the other three components. Support for that classroom teacher, libraries, technology, counselors, etc. All the people that have to be on the staff of a, a well-operating district to make sure that the teachers have the support they need to provide the instruction that the students need. Building management, principals, janitorial, assistant principals, administrative people, all of those costs were calculated to a great detail. And then the central office, guys like Scott Rebels actually have to be around. And they have important stress filled jobs to do. And they are certainly a part of that central office, but they need staff, they need treasury, they need what is known as EMAS, the Education Management Information, information System, data collection, so that the Ohio Department of Education, you know, their own district can understand what is happening where the costs are lying and what they might have to do to improve the way in which we finance the money. 
And of course, the all important issue is how much does this school district have to pay um, these established costs that satisfy the identified needs, the identified need of the students that are being uh, instructed in that particular district. That, of course, depends, as I've already been suggesting, on the relative capacity of school district to be able to support the school. The higher the capacity, the lesser amount that you get from the state. The lower the capacity, the higher the amount that you get from the state. We still don't know which one of those three districts was being funded at the proper level because that particular old system we talked about was so difficult to understand and to apply. It begged to be dropped and replaced. So, John Patterson, Rob Cutt, have done the education community in the state of Ohio, the legislature in the state of Ohio, and the parents of the state of Ohio, the citizens of the state of Ohio, who make make the failure by trying to gain rationality, transparency, objectivity, a need-based system to funding the education that all the different students in the state of Ohio require. Be happy to try to answer some questions later on, but I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, James. I'm here to hold you. Good evening, everybody. First of all, we're going to do some mutual admiration society because we thought Jim was nice enough to talk about town speaker Tuck and former representative Patterson, which means when two people who have put the legislature together went off to different things. So this group that your superintendent is part of, I don't think I'm going on the limb saying that we in Ohio have never had such an in-depth look at education, K-12 education in Ohio. So this is not neither or game. This is not a, you know, one side of things or the other. The amount of effort that they put in, the amount of work product we get to work to and come up with the system is immense, immense. So this is you know, the beginning, really, of looking at school funding in the So thank you, Jim, thank you, Scott, for doing that. Now, I also have to say this, which hat do you want me to wear? Do you want me to wear the state senator hat in the Supreme Court district that represents Bay Do you want me to wear the state finance chairman who's responsible for putting the entire budget together? Because I'll, I can summarize it pretty quick and then I want to give some history quick context. They did a wonderful job of explaining what the surf funding formula does. And I don't disagree with any. As a state senator from Bay Village, there's a big part of this funding formula that will not change much for us. Jim just alluded to it. It's the charge off. So we're going to spend a lot of time figuring out what the base cost of educating the food. Now, there are some issues within that that I have questions on that we didn't know about. We're going to work through those. But we're going to figure out what this cost is. And then the charge off. We're going to look at 60% property tax and 40% income tax. That's the wealth capacity of the different districts. And that is where your per pupil funding from whatever the number is, whether it's 6100 now or 7250 later, that's where the state share gets dramatically reduced for districts like Bay Village. Because we are saying it is a state and local partnership. But the law has kind of flipped the case. Because when the law came back in 1997, there were a number of districts throughout the state where they couldn't match in their own levies the 50% that the state was providing. So that's what they said, well, wait a second, this is an over-reliance on property taxes, meaning I'm going to use some numbers for me. You know, if, if they got $10 and uh, from the state, and their village only allows them to raise two dollars. Well, then they only have twelve dollars for their school. For other districts, well, they're getting ten dollars from the state, and their levy they can raise twelve dollars. They get twenty-two dollars. 
I don't know if any of those was more than 1997, but I know what Charter in high school was. It was 50-50 when Brock came out. 50-50. Now, these schools, these 500 plaintiffs who sued, they wouldn't sue now. Not a chance. Because that charge off for them, when they don't have the wealth capacity, they don't have the property value, and they have the income, allows them to keep more than the, cost, the base cost funding. The village is the one that should say, well, wait a second, we are, if we don't you know, tax our own people, we're getting next to nothing from the state. So, there are things that I did in budget to try to fight to make sure that my school districts got monies that were equivalent to, yeah, I don't want to get too much detail, but the private schools, get to, the Catholic schools get some money for auxiliary services. Uh, they get more. You're saying, they break you because you don't have to pay for students and they have to uh, and that is because we have decided that if they're going to do certain things, we're going to help pay for it. I got a bill to the governor's desk that said we're going to at least make the lowest school districts, because of the charge off, pay more than we want, at least be equivalent to the auxiliary funding we got in front of the EBT. So I'm going to try it again. So when I wear my hat for the Senate 24, it's almost irrelevant to the, the, uh, the formula. As long as there's a charge off based on property wealth and income wealth, you're not going to do well. Great, where I come from, it doesn't have to be very well. It doesn't mean that the effort they're not putting in is not worth it because we need to, we need to understand what does it cost to educate children. Where my state said it, they're financing that. So in draw, we spent $5 million a year on schools. This past year, we spent $11.4 billion a year. That doesn't include the twelve billion dollars that we put into school facilities uh, around the state. So there is an ever increasing amount of money going into the formula, and I respect that there's money going to charter and all those. But in the formula, the money has gone up every single year since Roth, which means the state share, which represents forty-two and a half cents of every dollar you spend in public, goes to K through twelve funds. So it is by far the biggest amount of money that we spend for your dollars. Now, when you factor in the federal government and Medicaid, that number gets skewed a little bit. But your Ohio State income tax dollar goes 42 cents of that, goes to gave you 12 education. The rest goes to everything else in, in state government. I also want to, um, I get asked all the time, uh, you know, why do we have to rely on property taxes? I can't, you know, what do other states do? Well, if we rely in this past year, not, not the fiscal year or not, the fiscal year 22, the property taxes around the state raised $12.77 billion. So you have the $11.5 billion the state's putting in, and you have the $12 billion the uh, property, the local is putting in. Now that's not far from 50 50. But then I open my remarks. You guys are, you know, you get a lot into that 12, you get very little of the 11 and a half. Um, but if we said, okay, we're going to replace that 12.77 and do it by income tax, we'd have to have a 144% increase in your income tax, state income tax. If we did it by sales tax to replace that property level, we would have to go from 5.75% which is current up to 12.25% just in your just in your state income tax does not include the local power. But the other factor still remains. Even if we did that, and we're all held early because we don't have property tax, the distribution formula still says a village, because of your wealth, that will give you as well. So we, we are on the right track for the state of Ohio. There is no question. But I'm telling you what I'm going to fight for, along with working with Jim to make sure we get this formula in place so that people understand it. Because that's really, we got to make sure that people understand this formula. But what's going to help pay bills is not going to be in this formula. It's going to be a bit different amendment that I'm going to put in to be a one off of this formula. Say, okay, despite the formula says pay bills will receive X, 
because it is one of the schools that either is below the auxiliary service level, uh, the 5% minimum applies to them, that we can make a, a, an artificial change to the, to the formula to for a the school that they go to get you more money. So this is great what we're doing, but we gotta be fair. It's not gonna be a huge income boost to Bay Village unless we do something else that I'm working on. I have to add that. I have to say that the experts are truly my way. I want to thank Senator Dole and I testified before you a couple of times. I found you to be a very cordial, concerned man, and very much interested in the position of the state of Ohio. So I appreciate you being here tonight on the East Side for not only the city, but the city of Ohio. So thank you for that. I, you know, the story of the local superintendent is yes to everything you have said. I'm spending my time in kitchen and living rooms right now, trying to explain why. Our cost continues to go up as resources are received outside from outside of our school district continue to go down. And I can give you all the numbers about for it's filled, but I think there's a couple of things here that I've heard that I really like. I'd like to support that auxiliary fund because I'd like to get seven hundred additional dollars coming into our school district currently right now is going elsewhere. That would reduce our revenue goes down to about three and a half years, which is something that would be considerably better for our I like for us to think about that school facility condition where you um, so proudly and rightly like so have talked about the state offering seven in the district for building facilities. I think that districts like Forest Hills that are, because of our community, are never going to receive most likely in my lifetime additional resources from the state. I think there's a 25% or 30% that's applied to all school districts about the state to be able to apply for it. The building uh, for, for things like that. So it's not this sort of lottery, not, it's not a lottery, but it's a situation where we're never going to be in a position, I think, to be able to receive, receive of those funds. So I'd like to see that. You had know, talked prior to this conversation about ESSER dollars in the state of Ohio. And I, and I actually appreciate what you had to say, which was can we use our ESSER dollars in different ways to offset some of the costs of the district for one time expenses? <laughs> we have to offset things like parking and other things. Extend beyond uh, 2024 if we would do that. Um, because those are resources, again, that we would be spending on staffing and other things that are not one time expenses. Um, so, the you auxiliary know, funds, I think, is a great idea on your part, sir. The ESSER dollars would like for you to consider resource programming. I believe for us, the local school district will use very differently, federal government. Uh, and I'd like to talk about the school facilities, uh, the ability for school districts like ours to be able to achieve more resources on that. Because if you look in Bay Village, you'll find that most of our facilities are beyond 50 years of age. And we're not going to have any capacity, I should say any capacity. We're not going to have very, we will have very little opportunity to take advantage of state dollars because of our wealth and our capacity, which is totally right. So in almost every category related to Bay Village, based on our perceived wealth, based on our property value and our personal income, we seem to be at the end of the line. And that's very difficult for the school like us. Because 73% of the resources that fund the schools come from our local communities. 55% of the funds that are collected from tax burden from our local communities. Uh, actually come to school. The other 45 percent go to other municipalities, county, auditor's office, other things like that. And they do increase on our account when our property values go up. So the probably the most consistent thing that I've had with this time in my career as a public educator is the lack of inflationary component in the state's funding method that helps us increase the resources coming to our district without having to go to the voters and explain why we are inefficient, fiscally irresponsible, and not spending money appropriately. The local argument, well, the local conversation 
is literally the term we use for the This community is absolutely supportive of the absolutely generous and concerned, and wants to lean in and do everything they can to their children. But they are absolutely getting close to that one. Their capacity is not necessarily what is what the model in the state of Ohio is suggested to And it's not their fault because they are invested to the highest degree in so many ways. So um, the last comment I would make, I was a uh, co-chair. I don't know why I didn't put me in this co-chair with the Indian party to talk about their funding going to sell money. <laughs> but what I argued at that time is when I was leading that all states, private, public, charter, whatever, in the state of Ohio, should have an opportunity for a quality education. What I agreed to and what I supported and what I testified to was ensuring that all students receive adequate funding. And therefore, I believe that providing those opportunities to kids in charter schools and community schools was a good opportunity. Now, there may be some of the further our public school superintendent will be thinking. I believe the children should have a quality education. What I don't necessarily agree with is the part of the plan of this particular plan of science. They really received $336 per student based on our, on our capacity. $346. Funding models are different from the state, excuse me. The funding model would suggest that it's about $7,200 per student. The average in the state, 2020, the average state share of the privately funded schools within our school district in Kyle County, the average in Kyle Hollow County is $4,500. If we receive $4,500 as do our privacy charters, which was my original argument to fund them at the same level so all children would have the same opportunities for quality education. We would receive ten or million dollars. We would receive ten million dollars from the state of property, which we currently receive four million eight hundred thousand. We would not need a level. We would not need a level. So that is my concern. I know. Uh, I echo what you know, the senator when you say we're in a great place and we're moving in that direction because there are 10 studies that were posted that were passed that are coming back and the information is coming back. We have a great relationship with the legislature in the state of Ohio, which is a very good funding and can be used of, and we will continue to do our work today. Those are the two things that we have to do today. Um, there is a high record that uh, Esther in our funds that have come because from the federal government because of COVID. So that's those were those dollars. So there's one cost right now, as Superintendent alluded to, you're sitting at about three billion more, very a lot to the all school system. You have to get them out until the end of quarter four. Um, the all the school district got expended. I love that's the book on this. That's why we're talking about one time purchasing for that. It's out completely outside of the country. May I make a time? Yes, please go ahead. Um, which state representative would be doing the general assembly? Which state representative would be doing the general assembly? And we have a few of that. There does not necessarily make that available to them, but it just doesn't have to be wrong. I'm speaking, by the way, for myself personally, the general of the new state of research who's on the plan to work with you. Does not pay the contribution on the law because that's uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is a COVID uh, thing that a non public school would receive more aid from the state uh, than does a public school district somehow reeks of idiosyncrasy. Thank you. 
this thing. <laughs> so again, let me, let, me, let me just be clear. So what I, what I worked on, I got together at Dex, match uh, 31 school districts around the state, of which Pedro would be one. You said they should at least get the amount of money that was for auxiliary services. That's not vouchers, it's not charter, it's dollars that we provide to, to the private schools, Catholic schools, for nurses, psychology, other other things that we require of the public school. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm not trying to make an equal to 4,000. I'm looking at auxiliary services. In, in two budgets to go, 31 school districts, it costs 32 million dollars. Which, you know, and, you know, when you say that it, sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but it's thirty-two million dollars out of eleven and a half billion dollar budget. What would those be in in days of what would those auxiliary funds? So when I did the bill, it was thirteen hundred to one thousand three hundred fifty dollars per student is what the auxiliary service is not like. That's what that's what we're taking those thirty one school districts to that one. So under the plan that you just shared with us, would that be those resources in addition to the three hundred forty six dollars? Well, your three hundred forty six dollars would be what the formula spits out, would you say? And then with my amendment, I'd say, okay, here's what that was standing on. Well, it'd just be to take your 348 and bring it up. There's nothing in the formula you can look to and say, how did that happen? It happened because you fell below the auxiliary service. You pay the floor then for spending. Yeah, so that was for the video. That's the exact right. Uh, answer, but if I use those terms, everyone runs here. She said, "Well, basically, what you're doing is you're creating a floor, right? Which is right, but for whatever reason, that seems to scare the Department of Education, scares some of my peers. Uh, so I'm not trying to use the term; I'm just trying to tie it to place it. We should once the form is all done, we should have some tools that maybe it doesn't make sense." Let's just let's just talk about it. Because the reason you don't want a floor is because if that floor keeps going up and up and up, even though the foreman might say, you know what? It's actually low. We should be lower. Hey, like, you're not. <laughs> I think uh, any questions about the a system put in place where you can get a tax credit um, if you donate money, like now they might say, no, say maybe if you donate a certain amount of money to a specific fund, you can actually get a tax credit for the amount of dollars that you donate. So is there any kind of talk about this in the filter for public schools? So it goes into scholarships. There were three new permits. <laughs> But the credit, I mean, the schools don't need credit off of any taxes. But they're... There, there's no, three different credits that went into play for homeschooling and contributing oh, yeah. to state income tax credit that was put into play starting in 22 for making donations to, to scholarship funds. They have to be approved. There's a list that's being accumulated at the state level. There's one tax credit. So they're all individual income tax credits that if taxpayers do X, they can get a credit on their individual income. Right. Okay. So you're saying if, if individuals made a contribution to pay bills, well, they can get a credit. Uh, it's an idea I can take back. I, I would wonder though how that would affect levies. So oh, I, if I choose to give all the leaves, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It, like I have people that have made created scholarship funds for parochial schools because of that tax credit as a way to get donors to donate and then the state is effectively subsidizing that donation via this tax credit. I, 
um, the, the text kind of approach ends up giving the individual donor a lot of power in policy. And I think the tax credit method is, is not a particularly good idea to make it clear you have a public system. So it's taking away the power from the public. It's taking the public from the public instead of really having to go to the As it stands, it's currently subsidizing tax using taxpayer funds to subsidize private education even further than what's in the biennial budget. Because the only ones that it's eligible to are private homeschooling yeah. and private schools. There's three new credits. Could you turn your mic on while you do that? A lot of the financing of think tanks that um, come up with policies to undermine the system get tax credits to do that. Mm -hmm. So I just think we need to be aware of the use of tax, giving tax credits for charity kind of thing is to not always the best for the state of the world. I'm wondering within Bay Village, how many students, how many parents are sending their students? more so to private schools? Is it a growing number or homeschooling? Um, are, are we finding that happening? I feel like most people probably are still sending their schools today because it is that school system. So, I think uh, the average is probably pretty consistent over the decades, but in the last couple of years, it's probably been about 30 to 40 percent of the The number, what percent go public versus private? In I don't have that figure. Yeah. And you're not saying that private schools are bad necessarily. I feel like for some students, they may be, but I don't want to pay for it. You know, I certainly don't want to give the private schools more money than the public schools. How did that? I don't even know how that happened. But um, it's such a no brainer. I don't understand why. I can speculate on a detail that it was about a reduced cost for quality of education that could be provided by the place. But I would say, um, whether you're in the Ohio or Southwest Ohio, or the center of the state, and I've been in all three of these independent, education is expensive, especially with some of the um, current trends we're seeing in the areas of special education and sort of the outside of the pool that we have in the state. Extremely expensive. The senator talked about that. The psychologists and nurses and paraprofessionals and many other um, services that are wrapped around students, in addition to uh, the difficulties of economically disadvantaged children and some of the issues with 
the medical issues related to those children and access to quality food and nutrition, heat and all of that. Those were very expensive propositions. Uh, and we saw the federal recognition of that and they provided the highest quality. Ohio schools and many others were provided. I can only speak for Ohio. I'm here with the rest. Or the blankets were made free to balance because it was a considerable circumstance to do. So I think it was about a better model at a cheaper price. But now in the last three years, I've sat with those individuals who operate those schools who tell me this is expensive. We need more money. And there are institutions that are supporting that because it is expensive. And that made its way into our conversations with the Fair School Planning Fund into the legislature. And there was some demand placed upon us as a committee to consider a level of funding for those institutions that was similar to what was in public centers. So uh, let me tell you why it's so great to meet you in the village. So I can answer your question. Now, put yourself in a completely other district. And you are in that district because of something we just kind of glossed over. We talked about the base cost of education. Then there's a whole series of categorical aid costs, which they go probably very, very little dollars for. Uh, and a lot of poverty based, English language based, food based. So that, that $6,100, yeah, those are all added. So now, I sit in my office and I hear from the private school saying, wait a second, a local public school gets $9,800 per student according to this formula. Why are we only getting $4,500? The village, the Red Falls, Bayfield, you know, everything's turned out its head. But, you know, we, my other peer, other centers are hearing, hey, it's not enough. Too, that like one of the things I understand that with the private schools are not also like the same state testing requirements and all of like the Department of Education, you know, requirements that public schools are, you know, they're still getting more money and they're still on the same funding model. Does that play at all into some of the discussions? Like if they should be held to the same caliber of you have to meet certain expectations with like the third grade reading guarantee and all the other state testing that our schools have to spend a lot of time and energy making sure they're complying with meeting expectations and standards and having it like reported out to the state report cards. So that depends on what type of private school some do, some don't. I would like to I'd love to give your superintendent and the Board of Education, your parents, more authority to how to serve on these less regulation from the state. So I think that's what that was. First, thank you all. It's been very, very informative. Uh, but with that said, I don't know who the question's directed at, but in the state formula, fund the funding formula, are there any incentives or disincentives for it? It's kind of building on what you just talked about for performance, you know, say improving whatever graduation rates or scores or anything. Is there any, any uh, you know, factor in the formula for determining uh, what a school gets? Or, and I'm not saying there should be, I'm just asking the question. Well, that's a great question. That was a lot of what the, uh, my committee asked of the group, Jim. <laughs> well, <clears throat> good. I think it's a great question because I think it's very really difficult to you know, craft incentives that can be fairly implemented at all school districts. Because the ability of the child when it comes to a certain school will vary a lot from those who come to other schools. Because of lack of the kind of what schools fall into the way that it comes from the mother's side. The Fair School Fund Plan is designed to develop and share and have. Definitely say possible. The whole issue of methods of vouchers, etc., 
Several years ago, the General Assembly, or the Portland Public Council, so that school districts could accept and roll the other community. That was their decision. And still that day, and still this is made by the school. It was funded by a transfer of funding to other schools. The school allowed to transfer to the public school. That created a certain condition. And Dr. Patterson, the father, has said, We do not want open enrollment to be incentivized or disincentivized because of the fair school funding plan. That is a policy that has been laid out by the legislature. The policy is going to change to be constructed separately. I'd like to come in too. Is that I believe that the funding system is designed to create people. It's trying is providing the resources for a base of opportunity. That's its purpose. It isn't about incentivizing and it's creating the opportunity for education for the children. And I think the and to lead in different kinds of incentives is a different policy goal than the basic. Is the main place. And the other thing that I think is really, when I said that we think about our local school districts, but actually our school districts are a part of the system of education. And one of the things that I think is so profound and wonderful about it is that in fact, we accept that in some communities they have more capacity and so they receive less. And so it has a distributive purpose. Which is about creating opportunities. So we're all sharing. We want what we want for our kids, but we also are responsible for the kids in the state of Ohio. And I think that's that's what makes me um, for the state and committed to working very hard to make sure that our funding system continues to do that. But we want all benefit kids, and we want the best for kids in any community. So that means some of us get more and some of us get less. And all of us benefit. Hopefully, the equal opportunity of the state. And this is something that is just really critical to people understanding this and um, wanting to make sure we have it. I have uh, one final comment that I would like to share. And I am proud of this work because it was done at a legislative level. That's extremely important. This is not done in corporate by a judge and believe on something that took place where there was a plaintiff and a backlog. We have a legislator in the state of Ohio leading, leading policy in our state that is not able to be adjusted in corporate. It will take legislation to make that adjustment. That is significant because since the law, most of the actual Okay, so we're 20 years of status and <laughs> criticism. But think about the amount of work and effort and years to be able to get something done legislatively that really is placed upon a path to something pretty significant. If we can get it funded in years three and four, implement the tweaks that we're talking about. Give them a little bit of a little bit of a a
Which I absolutely love, but they're still floundering, I feel like, some of those districts. I love that we're doing that. I love that some of these communities that need more money go. Yet they're still floundering, a lot of them. How, how do you explain that? How much money has to go to get the money? <laughs> Well, this one uh, question, this is an Uber question. Thank you. This was very informative. And then, you know, this giant hair wall, <laughs> you know, just beginning uh, it's sort of out of me. But I'm just wondering in the, in talking about the, the Uber State Education, the state of Ohio, the public school education in Ohio of our children, that every parent in Ohio wants to flourish. Um, the component of the funding of uh, state money that goes to the private sector, the private schools and vouchers and all the other categories. Um, what is the distribution of the availability of those kinds of um, private um, entities in the state? Maybe I'm going to just add on that. I'm kind of really concerned about the tax bill. Um, where every kid gets a voucher, it, it sounds to me like that might be very disruptive to the village. Um, maybe a quick one on it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you're looking at the law. Yeah. In, 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 but it is relatively the amount of money that goes into these private. And charters. Charters are a whole different charter part of this problem. But when you look at the amount of students that are actually taking advantage of the voucher system, it's not very much. Okay, so we have about 68,000. And there's like 1.2 million dollars. So about 80 million dollars that goes to the private school system. Okay. Um, so uh, the bank bill, I don't think we'll see anyone. But there is a number of ways that it, you know, say money follows the student. So they want to give every student the amount, a certain amount of money. Um, well, a lot of those are bumpers like I have. Uh, well, I, I one lady who was sponsored, I asked her, okay, well, that's great, okay. Are you going to give Sharon Falls $7,000 to Because if you are, you will just increase them $6,200 that the state doesn't pay for right now. So where is all of this money uh, coming from? And then it is the worst part of the backpack bill for me. The concept of, of letting a child be educated wherever the child is, I, I like it because I may know it's just an old water against any school. No, let's say I live in public schools, we think they can. So a parent wants to make a choice, we should give them. The part that bothers me is that that will utterly ignore category. So there's some reasons these school systems are tough. Because they, you know, have a child who comes to them who, you know, maybe slept in a shelter the night before, maybe had to have things to eat since they left school the day before, uh, comes from an abusive family. You know, that's what to, to see for. That's what we're all agreeing to pay for. We don't have it to pay for. That kind of girl just simply ignores it. Because, well, that's a step of over. So, I do think there will be a push pull with choice and public schools. And this is what I would say though. If, if this is the amount of money we do for choice, about that, and this is the amount of money we spend on public schools, I don't think it's going to go like this. I think it's going to go like this. So, uh, well, Barton. Yeah, yeah. 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 
folks we can pay attention to it and we can pay attention to the state legislators who vote for it. Okay. Hey, anybody uh, wants to sign in the back of my car? Follow me in my car. Great. So that's not a Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.